Uh, hello again. Um, as we all know, one of the huge stories of the last two years has been the explosion in women's sports. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, the WNBA. And one of the first executives to see the potential here and to see the rise of women's sports and capitalize on it was Brian Lawler of Scripps. Brian, tell us, what did you see uh, about the sports and about these leagues that made you invest? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Usually, if you go after Burke and then Laz, it says uh, coffee break. <laughs> so the fact that you all stayed here, I assume that half of the people are at coffee break. Um, but thanks. Um, yeah, look, you know, we bought Ion. So Scripps is a 140-year-old media company. We own uh, Ion, which is our big national network. We own like Core TV and Bounce and some other stuff. But for the last 30 years, we started HDTV, Food Network, and now we own 60 local TV stations. And after buying Ion, the prior owners really had just sort of a, a you know, programmatic strategy um, around uh, procedurals, NCIS, Law and Order, uh, Blue Blood, stuff like that. Yep. And so after we bought it, we probably spent six or nine months just looking at programming as a whole, locally and nationally, to just better understand what was happening in the next decade. And obviously, one of the places we looked was sports. Um, ION's actually the fifth highest rated broadcast network behind NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox. All of them have massive sports strategies, and our prior owners had none. And so we spent a lot of time looking at the sports ecosystem and said, is there a place for ION? So many rights were gobbled up, and what would that look like? But trying to identify, you know, we have this, ION's an over-the-air broadcast network. It's a lot like NBC, ABC. It has local towers, local affiliates in every market. It's fully distributed on cable, on satellite, over the air. So it reaches every household. It's a fast channel um, as well. So literally any household in America that has a TV can get eye on. And so as we looked at sports, one of the things that was really obvious that other than the NFL, most leagues have a reach problem. They struggle to reach you know, the masses. Even if they're on cable or on Turner or ESPN, they're only reaching 60, 70 percent of the households in America. And yet we had this platform that reached 100 percent of the households in America. And we said, is there something we can do? So we ultimately identified that if, if leagues and teams were struggling for reach, we could solve that, but what rights would be available? And we looked out for next number of years. And one of the places that we started to hone in on was women's sports. And the more we looked at it, you know, you see women's basketball, when in the NCAAs, you see, every year we saw the ratings going up, softball, volleyball, like anytime you put women's sports out there, it was growing. But the problem was it's really hard to be a women's sports fan in America because you just couldn't find them. There was no consistency of where it was. It'd be, you know, ESPN on a Wednesday night would have a college basketball right. game, and then next thing you know, it's NBA TV or something, you know, on Sunday. And so we ultimately believe that with our platform, putting women's sports on there, we had a platform, because it was unencumbered by any other sports, we could actually program and create franchise nights. And so that ultimately became our strategy that we presented to the Scripps board back in November of 2022. We sort of laid out the sports ecosystem. We said, we think we have a, a platform that will solve reach problems. And we think rights for the WNBA are coming up and maybe even available right now and the NWSL in the next year. And we felt like if we could create franchise nights where every Friday, every Saturday, we had professional women's sports in a place that is available in every household in America, that we could make a difference, that we would make it easier to be a women's sports fan. And we believe that the game was not inferior. It was a really good game, just nobody could find it. And so that became the strategy. And ultimately, you know, a couple months after going public that we were starting Scripps Sports, we engaged with some conversations with the NBA. They already had some you know, rights deals done, but we said, well, let's talk about, you know, can we carve out a package on women? And we ultimately engaged with them that they gave us the rights to every Friday night game for the season. And, and again, because we're built like NBC or ABC with local affiliates, if there were three 730 games, we could make one a national game, put that across the whole country, but if Atlanta and um, Connecticut were also playing, and they were in our national game, we could locally insert those games into Atlanta and Connecticut. Yeah. And so we picked up all the rights to that. And, you know, look, our timing 
we suddenly looked smart. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we certainly didn't. Uh, I'd never sat in front of the board and said, Caitlin Clark's coming and it's going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. But our thesis that if we made the games visible, that people, it could make it easier to be a fan and people would watch more consistently. And then, of course, you know, this freshman class that came out, Cameron Brink and Angel Reese and, and Kate Martin and Caitlin Clark, just, you know, were these big names and people have latched on and it's been incredible. Yeah. Um, you made the point, Brian, that uh, Caitlin Clark reminds you in a lot of ways of Larry Bird. Yeah. Um, you know, he and Magic came in to the NBA at a time when the NBA Finals was on tape delay and the NBA was down here. And they have similar personalities. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, as I watched her, and I, I, we were talking, I had the opportunity to go to the Women's Final Four last year, and then ironically, Indiana with the first pick. And the more I watched her, I thought, Boy, she plays just like Larry Bird. Yeah. She's scrappy. She's aggressive. She's Midwest grown, um, and uh, you know doesn't really care what people think. Just wants to win. Was unbelievable in every aspect of the game. And the more I watch her, man, she reminds me of of Larry Bird, and and uh, she's fierce. Yeah. And it's amazing what she's done. I think earlier in the season the stat got out, but from 2008 till the beginning of this year. There was not a single WNBA game that reached a million viewers in the US. It's over 20 games so far this year that have surpassed a million. We've had six on, um, uh, on ION. Two weeks ago, we had uh, Angel Reese in Chicago yep. at Indiana on a Friday night. We reached 1.6 million viewers, peaked at almost 2 million. Uh, this past weekend, I wasn't sure, we had Minnesota visiting Indiana. It was head to head against the NFL game in Brazil and the men's finals of the two Americans, uh, the semifinals in the US Open. So I thought, well, I'm not sure what this is gonna do. 1.2 million viewers. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the loyalty and the fandom that's been created really is remarkable. Yeah, that to me, Brian, the, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, when the women's college uh, final outrated the men for the first time in the NCAA, everybody said, well, this isn't gonna translate to the pros. But as Brian just said, Caitlin Clark and WNBA are going up against the NFL on Friday night from Brazil and still drawing uh, massive audiences. Uh, another thing that Scripps is doing that I really like and I think is interesting is you're building studio programming, yeah. shoulder programming around these events. Talk about, Brian, how that helps drive viewers to the games. Well, look, I think, again, our whole goal was to create exposure for women's sports. And so, number one, put the games where people can watch, but also let people get to know the teams and the players. And so we wanted a platform to tell stories. So we created a, a, a studio show. So we have the WNBA on Friday nights from 7 o'clock to midnight. On Saturday nights, we do the same with the NWSL. We have a doubleheader. And in both cases, we do a studio show um, for a studio we built in Atlanta from 7 to 7.30. We have the first game at 7.30. Usually come back to a, a studio show to sort of wrap around and then do a 10 o'clock game. Um, but we wanted to tell stories. And, and part of it, the WNBA is easier because people are really educated on, you know, the sport and points per game and leading scorer, and leading rebounder, and triple doubles and all that. So we're able to break out the game, you know, with a level of, of depth there. But we also wanted to tell stories. And so, you know, Scripps is a 140-year-old media company um, and journalism's at our core. So we do a piece every week, a three, four-minute piece that we pick a player and we tell their stories about what they've come, you know, their upbringing and, and what they've overcome. You know, you see like the Olympics, right? You sit down and watch the Olympics, they do a feature on somebody you've never heard of. Next thing you know, for the next 17 days, you're rooting, uh, rooting for that player. Right. The very first week with the NWSL, we introduced our studio show. We did a three-minute piece on a woman by the name of Carson Pickett. Carson was playing at that point for uh, uh, Racing Louisville. I'd never heard of Carson Pickett before. She has one arm, and she made sort of national attention a, a number of years ago when a little boy with one arm was at one of our games, and after the game, she was walking by, and they had this little fit knee, uh, uh, elbow bump moment right. that sort of went national. And so we got the little boy, we brought, her, brought him back, and we, we didn't tell um, Carson we were going to do this, but we inter requested an interview with her, and we walked in with the little boy. Yeah. And this piece was unbelievable. I'd never heard of Carson Pickett before. I'm a Carson Pickett fan for life now because of the storytelling. And that's the kind of thing we're doing. There's players in the, N in the NWSL that are, after they're done with practice, they were like going to university medical centers and working on cancer research and things like that. Like these um, women are amazing 
and it's been awesome to be able to tell their stories. So the storytelling platform was necessary for a studio show to be able to do that. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're really trying to lift and advance the, the visibility of the players and the teams inside of women's sports. Yeah. The NBA and WNBA media rights negotiations was literally the story of the last two years. I must have wrote, you know, 50 stories on it. Uh, as you say, you seem very happy uh, with your relationship. Love it. Your deal is uh, coming up in 25. What are your thoughts? We absolutely expect and hope to, you know, continue a long-term relationship with the W. I think they love what we did. Again, we were the first win before anyone else. We created a franchise night, double headers, national distribution, locally inserting. That was before Caitlin Clark ever came into the league. And since then, obviously ESPN and ABC have moved more games to prime time or you know, Sunday afternoon. Same thing with CBS and others. But we were the first ones in. And to create this platform for women's sports uh, and the storytelling aspect. So you know, when the N NBA uh, rights became available, um, you know, I flew to New York and sat down with the NBA folks and just said, hey, everything I'm reading says you're going to deal the WNBA rights along with this. Like, where do we stand? We're obviously not going to be bidding for, you know, uh, uh, against Laz for uh, right. Uh, the rights. And uh, they said, we really find what you do is valuable. The audiences you're bringing now are huge. We're going to do what we can to protect Fridays so that we can be back at the table with you guys uh, to talk about a renewal. They did. They All their deals and all the pieces they gave away or, or distributed more than 50% of the WNBA rights, but they protected Fridays for us. And so um, we got a little bit of work to do. Uh, I'm guessing we're going to have to open up our wallet a little bit more. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would uh, expect that we'll have a long-term relationship with them. But, again, as you noted, consistency is the key. If yeah. people know where to find women's games, you know, every week they get into the habit and it makes your job so much easier. It does. I mean, that was, you know, if you can be there every week, it allows for habits to develop. And once habits, you know, uh, and especially now, I mean, again, we talked about this freshman class that came in, but you go to these games. I'm going to the, um, the, the Fever um, Aces game in, in Indiana this uh, coming Friday. Half the, half the uh, audience is young girls. And so having them home on a Friday night, being able to know where to watch it and sort of it becomes a family ritual watching yeah. these games before going to bed. Um, I think we're starting to really develop a habit uh, that was so important by having this franchise we built. Yeah. And, and one of the, the great things for me personally and for a lot of dads is if you're a, a girl dad and you have daughters, you could share these uh, games with them and share the excitement they feel. My own daughter saw uh, Caitlin Clark uh, play at the University of Maryland and said it was the sporting experience of her life. Mm. Uh, so I, I was uh, thrilled about that. Brian, so far your wheelhouse has been women's sports and regional sports. Yeah. Now that everybody knows Scripps is here to, to play and that you're here to stay, what are you looking at next? Yeah, look, you know, we have a really unique asset in ION, a big nationally distributed network. We get a lot of calls. Um, but we want to be smart. Our goal is not to turn ION into a sports network. ION is a really big, profitable network with NCIS, Blue Bloods, you know, uh, Law and & Order. And so we like that. I mean, we're sort of a lot like TBS, TNT, um, where you know, they have their comedies and things in certain buckets, and then they have sports in other time periods. So you know, we are, and we're not interested in just dumping something in and disrupting it you know, like we, you know, people sit, it's crazy. People watch like Law and Order for like seven hours in a right. row. Like, I don't know what these people do, but they just sit and they get watch an episode, they get sucked into the next one, the next one. It's amazing. And so like to, to stop that, put in sports and then come right back to it, we lose the flow. Yeah. So we did for the first time a couple of weeks ago test a Sunday afternoon. We um, acquired the rights to the men's and women's finals of the AVP, the Manhattan Beach Open. Um, and that was great. You know, we sort of stopped ION. We did two and a half hours of live uh, volleyball, uh, you know, sand volleyball. Reached 300,000 viewers. The year before, it had been on ESPN2. It reached 54,000 viewers. So, you know, we know that we can attract a sports audience, but we're sort of just figuring out what else makes sense. We're not, yeah. you know, like we want to build franchises. We would like to build consistency and sort of own stuff. So, you know, we'll see what else makes sense there. You know, we've had a lot of success becoming the leader in professional women's sports. Uh, that was never, that was a target for us, but we never said we would only be women. 
And so, you know, I think we're open-minded to other things. You know, on the local and regional side, uh, you know, while we presented to the board this strategy on, on women's sports, we also presented to the board that we saw a lot of opportunity in the markets where we had local TV stations, especially the markets where we had second stations, because I'm sure my exact words to the board were, the regional sports net business is a disaster. Right. And we did not predict, you know, the bankruptcy of Diamond. But what we said was that was a great business 10 years ago when regional sports networks reached 80% of the households in America. And today, in almost every market, it's less than 50. And in some cases, it was less than 40. And so to own a professional baseball team or hockey team or something in a market and to reach 35% of your fans, that's not a good business model. Even yeah. if the check cashes, and these are big checks, yeah. you know, if you're missing two thirds of your fans, you're not building you know, the future fan base, you're not selling tickets, you're missing out on merch, all that kind of stuff. And so we believed, again, that same theory of having an over the air broadcast network, bringing these games to linear television, putting them on cable and satellite and over the air was gonna be a great platform. And uh, turned out our timing was right. Um, you know, Our first opportunity was in Vegas where um, their previous re uh, RSN, AT&T, uh, Rocky Mountain shut down in the middle of the contract. They went to him and said, "We're out." Yep. And so, even with a couple of years left, and so we were able to go in and talk to the Golden Knights. We owned an ABC station in Las Vegas. We were able to stand up a second TV station, independent station. And so, last year we had our first season with the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. We had you know 70 of 82 games. The rest are on you know national TV. But we doubled the audience. We doubled the ratings. Um, 43 of the top 100 sports shows in Las Vegas last year were Vegas Golden Knights games. So people are truly engaged in the sport. We added a direct-to-consumer partnership where not only are we providing over-the-air broadcasts, but we partnered with the team to stand up a streaming app that people could buy for $69.99 for the season. We had more than 10,000 subscribers. And that way, wherever people were in their lives, they had the ability to you know, watch a Golden Knights game. They didn't have to be home in front of a television hanging on the wall, yep. on their phone, on their tablet, whatever. And you know, we really you know, increased uh, the engagement in that market. And so this year, um, we're two for two, by the way, picking up the last two Stanley Cup champions. We got Vegas right after they won. We just picked up Florida. So that's part of our sales pitch now. We go in and say, like, if you sign with us, you'll win the <laughs> Stanley Cup this year. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then we also have the Utah hockey team. So we'll have three NHL teams this year, and we really like the opportunity to just br let fans see their teams. Yeah. Same, you know, on the national level with the women's sports, on the local level, you know, they shouldn't be tucked behind paywalls. They shouldn't be, you know, locked where you know they're only reaching 30% of the households. These are community teams. They bring communities together. Communities celebrate their teams. It's yeah. the one thing that, like, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, Republican, Democrat. Like, you put everybody in a stadium, they're just fans. Yeah. And that's the beauty of sports, and we're able to do that. And so. We're looking to do more of that. Yeah. Talk about your growing relationship with the NHL. As Ryan noted, he's signed the last two Stanley Cup champions. I'm a hockey fan, and if you know hockey fans, they are so passionate. When you write about their sport, when you cover their sport, yeah. they are so into it. And, of course, it's, it's now a cliche, but no game is better in person. Absolutely. Why are you so uh, interested in the NHL? Um, well, you sort of got to go where the rights are available. And I think they've been the one that's been most open to – breaking the model away from the regional sports networks. There's still a growing league, right? Of the three, baseball, you know, they're trying to keep everything together and sort of yeah. move together. You know, the NBA, uh, they're in the middle of doing their rights deal and they've been trying to protect that and keep that together, although a couple have broken out. But the NHL, I think, you know, is still the one they're saying, you know, for their teams to only reach 35 or 40% of the households, they need to reach more to grow. Yeah. And so they were very open. Obviously, we were the first team, um, the, the Golden Knights, to go over the air broadcast, and then they look at the ratings, seven household rating, up 100% over the year before, and the engagement was terrific. And so more and more teams, you know, were leaning into that. Now you see, what, four or five teams that have broken away from the regional sports networks, uh, partnering with the local broadcasters, and uh, I think the visibility and, and our ability, again, to, you know, use our, 
our primary station. So in Las Vegas, in, in, in Utah, um, in Miami, and, and in West Palm, um, you know, we have primary television stations. So we're able to use that you know, big station in our six o'clock news to drive viewership, to drive people, go buy season tickets, right? There's so much we can do to just increase the visibility. NHL teams sort of were third fiddle in terms of visibility in their markets, yep. with a partnership with us and our, you, you know, our big stations really leaning in, and we're creating shoulder programming, store, you know, shows, weekly shows about the team off the ice, uh, helping people learn hockey. Um, the visibility is much greater, and it's been very successful so far. Yeah, it, timing is everything. You know, the other big story last year was the crumbling of. Uh, the cable bundle and RSNs pulling their deals with teams and leagues and along comes script sports. <laughs> Did they, you uh, came to them as an alternative and said, all right, you know what I mean? If they can't pay your, uh, your uh, fee, we'll go into business with yeah. you. Did they treat you like a white knight? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think, you know, they all came tiptoed in cautiously but, you know, so obviously Vegas, we've talked a little bit about them, but Bill Foley's their owner, Kerry Bubolt's their president. From the beginning, they said, even if we had to take a step, step back in, in revenue on a rights fee, we want to be in front of our fans. We, you know, they were in their sixth season as an NHL team. They were very popular, but they wanted to make their fans, uh, their games available, even if, they, if it was less money, because they believed more tickets uh, more butts in the arena, buying drinks and all that, and then more merch. And so they were committed from the beginning that, because their previous relationship with the RSN reached 35% of the households in yeah. Vegas. And they just said, that's not good enough. Yeah. And so it was a commitment from the owner who said, I want to put this over the air and make the games visible. And, and once they did that, I think every other team in the league was watching. They saw the success. Um, they became our greatest sales people. I never had to call an NHL team because all the NHL teams, even the play-by-play -play people would ask the Vegas play-by-play -play people, what's it like doing with script sports, with the numbers? And so it sort of grew from there that, wow, these guys. And the other thing was like, every Bally's production looked exactly the same. You know, when we sat down with the Golden Knights after doing the deal, we said, you know, look, we don't have another team, so let's build the on-air look, the graphics, the, like let's do it together. And we built something that looked totally different, modern, representative of, of Vegas. And so if you watch one of those games, I think it's refreshing. It's just clean. And, and, and you know, we, we integrate a lot more stats and data. And so it's a whole different presentation. And it's really appealing to fans. Yeah. In a way, we've kind of gone back to the future, haven't we, Brian? I mean, yeah. 20, 30 years ago, sports was moving from broadcast TV to cable, to pay cable. Now we're seeing sports go back to broadcast TV. Why is that happening? Uh, you know, I'm a misplaced New Yorker based in Cincinnati where <laughs> our company is, but I grew up here with, you know, the Yankees on PIX11 and, and the Mets on 9, and anyone could watch it. Um, Bob Murphy. Yeah, exactly. And look, it's a really confusing time. I mean, you just listen to, uh, to uh, Burke and to uh, uh, Mark. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of movement. What's consistent is just over-the-air broadcasting, you know. And again, and now it's easier than ever. You get a digital antenna for 20 bucks on Amazon. You plug it into a TV. You buy a Costco, and poof, you get 40 stations for free, crystal clear HD, no latency. I mean, it's by far the best signal available. And you know, and, and there in that 40, you know, channels that you get for free, there's a local station that has local sports. Um, I think we've just made it easy, and you know that was the beauty of when we were growing up. Everyone got to watch every game, yep. and you know kids come home from school and they get to watch a game. And even if their parents can't afford cable or don't have cable, you know it's available in every house, and that makes it really simple. Yeah. What does the future look like for for script sports? You know, give me uh, your predictions. You know, what I mean, for the next year or two. Yeah, I think you know we will continue to build out the women's sports franchise. Um, you know, we, we're got, I don't know, seven or eight weeks left in our first season with the NWSL. Um, they sort of remind me of where the WNBA game, uh, season or league was three or four years ago, where the game is really good, but there's not a lot of household names. Um, you know, I spent some, a couple hours with them yesterday and just, you know, said, like, you know, it wasn't teams that moved the WNBA, it was players. And you have some really good players that just came out of the Olympics, Sophia Smith and uh, Rodman and, and people like that. Like, 
that NWSL needs to identify their future stars and we need to build their stories and tell their stories and yeah. grow that. And so I think we're very much committed to working along both of these leagues to continue to increase the visibility of women's sports. And then, you know, I think, you know, there'll be a lot more local, sport, uh, local sports teams that become available. Yes, you know, Diamond now has re-signed and, and uh, appears to be on its path to re-emerging from bankruptcy. But we did a lot of contingency planning with teams, NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball all over the last couple of years. Had Bally's, uh, had Diamond not re-emerged from bankruptcy and, and got the deal done with the NHL and the NBA, we would have announced three or four more deals for this coming season. Yeah. So had them papered, ready to go, in agreement. There are other teams ready to move to local broadcast. They want that reach, they want that visibility. Right now, they, you know, either the money was still better with Diamond or they couldn't get out of their deals. Yep. Um, but those deals will expire, you know, and they're all one, two, three year terms. And I think you'll see more and more broadcast move. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to look for more thing. We haven't talked about the fact that we have a big partnership with the NCAA and the Big Sky Conference. I mean, you know, Granted, the big sky compared to Burke sitting here talking about the SEC and, <laughs> and the Big Ten, uh, uh, I need to be humbled. But, you know, if you go down to, like, Montana, that Montana, Montana State football, there's no professional sports in Montana. You put one of those games on every weekend, and this thing does double-digit ratings. And, by the way, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, when Montana, Montana State play each other, it's a Super Bowl. Last year in the five TV markets in Montana, the lowest rating uh, in any of those markets was a 34 household. It is literally a Super Bowl out there. So using the over-the-air broadcast platform to make games available to their fans is something that we can do, and we can do it with consistency. And so I think that's another really good example of the power of the platform. Yeah. Brian has spoken to me uh, several times about the importance of reach. And NFL Commissioner... Uh, Roger Goodell talks about the importance of reach. Is that part of the appeal of broadcast again, that you can deliver this reach yeah. to your, your partners and your teams that they're just not getting anymore? That's it. I mean, that's the thesis. That is you know, what we told our board back in, in 2022. What we have, these over-the-air broadcast platforms, solve everyone's problem, reach. We can make these games available for free, but over the air where everyone gets to see them. And it solves a massive problem. We saw that growth in, in, um, in the NHL. We've seen it now in the WNBA, the NWSL. The fact that every household in America can see it and they're watching it. Same thing in the Big Sky and the NCAA football, right? That even in Montana, making those games available, we're solving the reach problem for teams and leagues. And that's a compelling, in this day of confusion of is it on streaming, is it this, do I have that app, do I have to buy that, you got a password? Like, like right. Just putting it on over there broadcast, just it's easy yeah. and, you know, it, and it reaches every household. Like you said, it reminds you when you were a kid, you could just you know, put on Channel 9, watch the Mets. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, it was the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Well, give it up for Brian. Thank you. Great job. Thank Thanks. you.